we have quite a lot to get through, both to understand the, the causes of uh, the exodus of the Rohingya to Bangladesh and elsewhere, uh, but also to try and sketch out what might be done within Myanmar, in Bangladesh, and also with international groups, uh, including ASEAN, looking forward to Singapore uh, taking the chair's role of ASEAN in January. So we've gathered an all-star panel uh, for your entertainment this evening. Uh, so let me go from left to right to introduce them very briefly. The format, I'll invite each of them just to make a kind of set of introductory remarks for somewhere between three and five minutes, depending on how much they feel they're bursting to say. Um, then we'll have a short discussion amongst ourselves and we'll leave time for questions at the end. Um, and hopefully we can hear ourselves over the thunder. So uh, on the far left uh, is Mo Suzar who runs the ASEAN Studies program at uh, ICES, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies here um, in Singapore, and also the, the Myanmar subject expert at ICES. Adam Cooper is the Myanmar uh, rep for the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue based in Yangon and has been involved uh, trying to find solutions to what's going um, on there at the moment and has lived in Myanmar for the last seven years, is that right? Uh, Emma Hogan uh, has lived in this part of the world for slightly less long, a recently arrived a Southeast Asia correspondent for The Economist, uh, but recently wrote, um, uh, well, went to Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, where uh, the refugee camps, or most of the refugee camps are in that area, so has written about that for The Economist and has also um, been in Myanmar sort of writing about the country more generally. And last, but by no means uh, least on my right, uh, literally but not politically or figuratively, Francesco Mancini, uh, from uh, who's, well, what is your title? Vice, Vice Dean? Vice Dean of the, at the school? Associate Dean. Okay, Associate Dean uh, and, uh, and Vice, Vice Dean and Associate Professor um, and uh, by expertise, uh, uh, Francesco has a background on conflict resolution, uh, used to work in a, an American-based think tank with close links to the United Nations, and therefore is going to bring that perspective to, um, to this. So that's them. Let's go down the panel. Maybe I can start, I'll go left to right, just in the way that I've done it. So Mo, could I, could I start with you? Um, uh, and, and so sort of set, set the scene from us and tell us kind of where, where the crisis stands. I believe all an informed audience of the tragic situation that's been happening with the humanitarian crisis that this recent exodus of Rohingya communities um, as a result of the very harsh retaliation uh, by the military in Myanmar uh, towards a reported uh, insurgency has occasioned earlier this year. Um, I'll start first with the current perceptions that we're dealing with. And when we talk about perceptions, they are very polarized. On the one hand, we have the international perception um, of the situation uh, based on the reports that uh, all of us have been reading and following. And uh, those perceptions, of course, are very much um, in sympathy, rightly so, with the plight of the refugees um, uh, who have been displaced. And um, it's not just with the current military crackdown uh, that these people have been displaced. Uh, these uh, conflicts, as most of us, all of us in this room are well aware, are of a cyclical nature with deep historical roots. Um, and they themselves, um, the situation itself has also arisen because of what I call the politics of polarization that successive authoritarian regimes in Burma, in Myanmar, have uh, implemented uh, over the decades, practically since the time of independence. So we have uh, one set of international perceptions, but the perceptions at the local level at, in, in Myanmar, at, uh, you know, among the, Myanmar, the Burmese people, are very different. Um, uh, they feel that uh, they are being uh, unfairly uh, accused. Uh, they, they feel that the, the other side of the story, the Myanmar side of the story, has not been uh, uh, has not been getting its fair share uh, in, the, in the papers and uh, some of the reporting mistakes and errors that international reports that have been seen in international uh, reports and uh, broadcasts and so on uh, only serve to kind of consolidate uh, the internal view that uh, there is a media bias and uh, people are 
uh, against uh, Myanmar. So it's almost an us against them kind of uh, mentality. And as a result of that, um, the support for State Councilor Do Aung San Suu Kyi is very strong. I was just telling my panelists that it's actually at um, the highest level of support um, for the present government ever. So um, there's, there's a lot of uh, leeway that uh, the leadership could probably cut, capitalize on uh, by some of the initiatives. And, and so that brings me to the next point about principles. Who are the principles who actually are in a position to act and do something uh, to bring about a solution to this decades-long problem? Well, it's not going to be overnight. Something that's been uh, entrenched and brewing for decades is uh, certainly going to require several years to uh, dedicatedly hack away at. But we're looking at really two broad sets of principles, the military leadership and the civilian leadership. And uh, there's, there's this narrative, of course, that uh, the civilian leadership uh, is constrained uh, by the very uneasy and imbalanced power sharing uh, arrangement uh, when it came to power, uh, with the military still retaining control over key ministries such as defense, home affairs, and border affairs. So um, these are the ministries that have also had a lot of jurisdiction over the Rohingya communities in Rakhine um, over the decades. And, and so we have these principals who also need to sit down together and talk about um, what is a good policy to deal with the Rohingya issue, which brings me to the next P, policies. There has been no policy on dealing with the Rohingya ever, until now. And, and even now, I think um, the efforts to do so are very nascent and uh, still very much, I think, listening to popular sentiments, which have actually, I think, fallen into the military narrative that all these people are illegal immigrants without actually really looking at who have been uh, residents um, for, for, for longer or since the time of independence and the um, stop-start type of uh, uh, verification processes um, for the Rohingya communities that the previous authoritarian governments uh, started but never finished or kicked the can down the road. Uh, so, so we have all these, these legacy issues and now I think for the first time we've got proposals from international partners. Um, these are governments. And United States and China, of course, most prominent among these recent proposals um, with Office of Financial Assistance uh, to assist uh, Myanmar deal with the issue. And um, build, looking at these, of course, we still need to really look at what are the details of all these proposals um, by the US, uh, by China, and by other uh, external partners, including international organizations. But for possible pathways, and this is where I bring in my ASEAN hat, I think ASEAN um, does have a role to uh, serve as the monitoring or the coordinating body. It hasn't uh, been able to do that, and I would put that down to the kind of dynamics that ASEAN has uh, in terms of who uh, actually is the current chair and uh, the constraints that the current chair has. Plus, ASEAN today is also quite a different animal in, in terms of uh, the kind of domestic agenda interests that all the ASEAN members, including Myanmar, have that kind of distract, distract it from uh, the, the regional collective action that uh, ASEAN has been known for in the past. But there is a possible pathway that, um, to make sense of all the proposals and initiatives and so on, local or international or uh, bilateral, swirling around, we do need an entity, a body, um, that uh, probably has a kind of like the trust of all uh, to monitor and, and help coordinate the situation on the ground. And by default, I think that role might go to ASEAN. Definitely, at the very least, we need to revive the regular reporting mechanism um, that uh, Myanmar under the military regime had to do um, at every ASEAN meeting. And I'm not just talking uh, among the leaders at the retreat level. I'm talking at the senior officials level and at the foreign ministers level where um, behind closed doors, uh, discussions can get pretty frank. I'm an optimistic person by nature, and I would like to ideally present to you a solution for these problems, but I'm afraid I'm going to be a little bit more pessimistic this evening.
and start by outlining three ways in which this could get yet worse. The first is, um, you know, we've seen a, 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 in northern Rakhine State a set of attacks by an armed group um, and a fierce backlash to it. The armed group which carry out these attacks has had its base of operations disturbed, uh, but I don't think anyone expects the drivers which cause that armed group to attack in the first place to stop them from doing such things in the future. So we should expect that to come back in some form, and when it does, um, we may well see the sort of military response that we've seen already. So another attack in the north is, is quite possible. In the geography of Rakhine State, you have the northern part of the state, which is uh, where the majority of Rohingya people live, where the insurgency is present, and where the attacks have taken place. You have the central part of the state, where there's about three or 400,000 Rohingya that live in the minority, and where the ethnic Rakhine dominate. The demographics are different, the security situation is different, but we've seen, as you may recall from back in 2012, communal clashes there, fights between different villages um, on both the Rohingya and Rakhine side. The attacks that have taken place have elevated tensions there enormously, and it's quite possible that that could easily tip over into communal clashes in central Rakhine state. And the third way in which this could get worse is another boat crisis. You've got uh, a million people in Bangladesh now who are displaced, not um, just the 600,000 who've come more recently. The conditions are desperate. Uh, the primary break on boats leaving has been the weather. The weather is changing. Uh, if people have the means to escape to what they perceive to be a better life in Malaysia, they may take it. And we've seen what happens when people leave on boats in regions. We've seen pushbacks from other countries, hundreds of people die at sea. That kind of scenario is not impossible. So what that means, I think, for all of us in terms of solutions, if you will, is that this is a more than anything a damage limitation exercise and not a conflict resolution exercise. Uh, this is about stemming and preventing things from getting worse. Very briefly, I, I, I think that this, there's so many angles uh, which one could take looking at this analytically. Um, but I'd, I'd like to just very briefly touch on three which I think are less covered in the international narrative of this. Um, the first is on the civil military side. And I, I think, as, as, uh, as my colleague Motizar alluded to, the simplistic narrative is the state councillor, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, wants to do the right thing and is constrained by the military from doing so. The reality is a little bit more complex. And the relationship is very core, um, not just related to Rakhine, but all policy issues. There is no functioning dialogue between top leaders, the state councillor and the commander-in-chief, or at a senior level just underneath them on any policy subject. Um, and I see this because we work on the, on the peace process between the government and some of the armed groups where that uh, failure to have policy coherence within this sort of fractured coalition government uh, means that it, it's very difficult to move forward. It's very difficult to have any kind of no negotiation. So the sine qua non of sort of moving forward in Myanmar is a functioning civil military relationship, which we don't currently have. The second point which is sometimes elided, I would say, is the ethnic Rakhine themselves, um, who make up the majority of the state, two thirds, who have their own grievances, like all ethnic nationalities in, in Myanmar uh, have been excluded from, from, from political life at the center, um, have had natural resources taken away from them, and so there's a very strong sense of their own grievances. And to the extent that the previous government or this government has tried to do anything positive, they've often acted as a break on that locally. So just to give you a small example of, of um, say, the course for citizenship for the range of people. There were, I think, 11 people who were processed for a form of citizenship uh, last year. And that brought out protests from the Rakhine in the, in the capital sitway. They forced the resignation of the state immigration officer and essentially, through that show of force, intimidated the government into stopping what they were doing. So when people say the Myanmar government needs to do more, we need to understand what are the political constraints that they face. And at least one of the things is, is the, the views of the ethnic Rakhine. And if they are de facto exercising a policy veto on what happens in that area, 
There is no solution without bringing them on board in some way. And I think linked to that, and this is perhaps stating the obvious, is that this is a deeply political problem um, that requires political negotiations to solve. Um, it's not something which a sort of well-meaning policy initiative from either the Myanmar government alone or that's dreamt up by a corner of the international community can fix. There are very fixed demands that the Rakhine community have, that the Rohingya community have, both inside and outside the country, red lines from the military, and what the international community wants to see. Reconciling those set of demands is a, is a very difficult political task. So you need, in an ideal world, someone at the center of the Myanmar government who's able to quarterback those negotiations, to talk, to persuade, to cajole, to strong arm different constituencies into finding a path forward. And that doesn't exist. And so long as that doesn't exist, um, we can pull lots of levers in the international community to sanction or to engage, um, but it's going to have a limited impact. So I'm sorry not to bring a more uplifting message to all of you, but that's the frank analysis that we see from where we sit in Yangon. So I spent several days in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, uh, the main one, Kutupalong, and, and several smaller ones. And being there led me to sort of three observations about the permanence of the camps, the diff difficulty of relocation, and the, what will happen with the stability, shall I lean forward more, stability of Bangladesh in the future. Um, so what are the camps like? Well, I thought that I had experienced refugee camps. Uh, for the year and a half before starting this job, I had written about the European refugee camps, refugee crisis. So I spent time in camps in Greece, in Croatia, in Germany, I'd gone to Turkey and spoken to people smugglers. I thought I knew what it was like. Um, but getting to Bangladesh, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, the largest camp, Kutupalong, at the time that I was there, about a month ago, housed 400,000 people. Uh, that's a sort of estimate. Probably much more now, many more. Uh, and they're in really dire condition. The situation is, is that it's a very large camp uh, with a rickety, camp, a rickety structures that the refugees themselves have built, made out of bamboo and plastic. Uh, there's a marketplace, there's, there's stalls, there's children running around everywhere. Um, there's very little access for aid uh, because, because of the sheer scale, but also because, as in some of the, the newer camps that have sprung up down in the south, they're very hard, hard to get to. So unlike camps in, in sort of desert countries in, in, in Yemen or, or Jordan, NGOs can't get easily into these places. Uh, they have to go through paddy fields. They have to walk, walk along small wooden bridges. Uh, they have to sort of go up, go up uh, muddy, field, muddy sort of steps that, in rain like this, become pretty hard to navigate. Uh, so that means that there are hundreds of thousands of people who are not getting access to medical supplies, and not getting access to food. So that was my experience of, 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 of seeing these, oh, and I haven't even started on saying that the, the stories that I heard from people were intolerably grim. Um, although many people were reticent of, of, of speaking exactly about what had happened, nearly everyone I spoke to had lost a family member, um, you know, whether it's their father, their son, their husband, uh, they'd seen some really dreadful things. So they're stuck in, stuck in awful conditions, um, most, you know, have suffering from great trauma, uh, and you know, basically stuck there at the moment. So that made me, the sort of the three observations I made, these camps are not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, indeed, Kutupalong has been there since the, since the 90s, so, and from earlier waves as well, from the, in 78. Uh, and now the sheer scale of them means that they're, they're not going to be moved. Uh, the Bangladesh authorities haven't really got a clear sense of what they want to do with the camps. There's been talk of a, creating a mega camp of Kutupalong, which would make conditions even harder for NGOs to get to. Uh, there's also been talk of, of shipping refugees to an island, which, as I understand it, is completely uninhabitable. Um, so although the, the Bangladeshi authorities have shown immense generosity uh, in, in, in having you know, 600,000 people cross the border, there isn't a clear game plan. Uh, there's not a sort of sense of which, you know, how, how is this going to go forward. So as I, as I understood it, you know, I felt that these were pretty permanent structures and they were going to continue to be permanent structures, which then leads to my second observation, which is the difficulty of relocation. 
talking to the Rohingya refugees, many of them expressed desires to go back home. I mean, they, they had livelihoods there, they had houses. Many of them owned acres of land. Um, but they only wanted to go back on the condition that they would be given their rights. And they felt that after a series of, 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 sort of what, what the UN has described as a you know, classic, well, seemingly ethnic cleansing after the most recent bout, but also previous ones, they didn't think that, that was going to happen anytime soon. And then the third, third point was about the stability of Bangladesh. I mean, that's not something that has been talking about Talk, talked about very much in the international media. But I mean, having half a million people cross, cross your border in one of the poorest parts of the country is going to create tensions. Uh, in previous, previous uh, in waves, for want of a better word, of, of Rohingya refugees making their way to Bangladesh, uh, locals became resentful towards you know, increased food prices. Because if you've got suddenly 100,000 more people, or 20,000 more people even, food prices are going to go up. Um, there was talk also of the spread of yaba, a particular kind of meth, which is made in Myanmar. So there's sort of big political implications, not just for Myanmar, but also for Bangladesh. And so that really, it's, it's hard to know what is going to happen or what the solution is. I mean, one parallel seems to me to be you know, Palestine, which is not a very, not a very comforting parallel. Um, it, it, it's just, yeah, it seems to me that these structures are going to stay there and they're going to get bigger and that it's going to be harder to know what to do. I feel somehow we, we start a larger and slowly kind of zoom in into, you know, all the way down to, to refugee camps. And let, let me try to do kind of the reverse approach and, and, and move it from, from the details up to, to the bigger picture. Um, because, I mean, it's obvious here that is, this is a crisis for the Rohingya people, it's a crisis for Myanmar, but it's obviously a regional crisis, so it has implications that goes well beyond the, the regional context. Let's go outside of Rakhine and just move into Myanmar, where there are at least another half million internally displaced people, um, approximately 20 ethnic armed groups, several hundred militias, and no real peace in sight. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is uh, an economy that is not delivering. Now, let's recognize that obviously in the last few years, uh, quite an impressive job has been done given the starting point. However, and maybe this is a crisis of expectation, um, there, are, there are worries that, uh, for example, the banking system is very unstable, uh, investor confidence is declining, um, some people, are, particularly in the West, have been talking about sanctions, or thought, I think there are unlikely right now, uh, but this all obviously is putting a lot of pressure hmm, on, on Myanmar and the people of Myanmar. Meanwhile, millions of people in Myanmar had access to internet, they have mobile phones, we moved to a tiny percentage of mo uh, mobile phones uh, ownership to approximately 70% of the population, um, and you know, Facebook is there, and everybody's on Facebook. Because outside, and more just said that, uh, we have a, a clear way of seeing this crisis, mainly from sort of the human tragedy of the Rohingya, and I think this is the right way, obviously, to, 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 to look at this point, uh, at this crisis. Within Myanmar, the views are exactly opposite. The view is that Myanmar is under threat. Is under threat from Islamic extremism and, and terrorists of, of ARSA, and the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. Um, Al Qaeda and ISIS didn't help because they made statements in September saying that uh, Yangon and Mandalay uh, should be uh, targets. Uh, all these, as you can imagine, on social media can be spent in, in infinite ways. And in fact, if you spend some time to go through what people post on, on social media, it's pretty ugly stuff out there. Um, it's a lot of very graphic material, and, and, and photographs, and, and, and the overall uh, rhetoric there is that this is all Muslim atrocities against Buddhists. Um, so it's against this backdrop that I think we need to understand also a resurgent nationalism uh, that is taking shape and combined also with a degree of Islamophobic sentiments. What I think is very important to understand and what my sense is kind of lost in a lot of the conversations that are happening in international environments, for sure in New York, within the Security Council, is that, again, this is not just a crisis due to issue of citizenship, but it has deep roots in issue of identities and discrimination. Um, 
don't know how much you knew about the history of, of, of Rakhine State, but you know, Rakhine actually in the region is called the Western Gate. Um, because has a tradition of being an entry point of external threats into Myanmar. In fact, that was very much the region where the British East Indian Company entered into Myanmar in 1824 and eventually put end to the Kingdom of Burma. Um, Bengali slaves were brought into the region since 1500. Uh, Local kings uh, were very cosmopolitan. They took both Bengali, Muslim, and Burmese titles. If you look at the architecture and the art, they're a very interesting mix. There even a reference to Afghan art. Um, so it's, it's a very complex region, right? But the reality is, um, once uh, uh, the British uh, um, took over there and encouraged migration uh, from the Bengali Muslim into, mainly into plantations, right, cheap labor, uh, by 1910, uh, the Rakhine were a minority. During World War II, just to complicate things, uh, the Japanese armed the Buddhist and the British armed the Bengali Muslim. And there's been massacres that happened between the communities that, of course, build you know, into the, the issue. And then, of course, 1978, and then in 1990s, when armed crackdown created big flows of, of refugees. Why am I saying all this? I say all this because, as someone who's been working on conflict resolution overall, I, I feel there is a fundamental quality for anybody who tries to address this issue, and that is called empathy. Um, empathy is not sympathy. It, it doesn't mean that you agree with, but it means that you try to step into the position, into the shoes of the other side, and you try to understand where people come from. Again, it doesn't mean you have to agree. And I feel that this is a quality that is often lost in uh, a lot of the international interventions. Now, obviously, you get a few European foreign ministers going to these refugee camps. It's horrendous. It's absolutely understandable that you come out of that situation and your first reaction is to come down with very strong public statement on these things because that's, that's it. As a minimum, as a human reaction. Of course, they also have their own constituencies. But I think if is this is very understandable, we have to also recognize that it's not very helpful. I would advocate for a much quieter diplomatic approach. And it, it's, it's hard at this stage to, to make any assessment. But the news the last 24 hours that there is this sort of a three-stage plan that China is saying that both Bangladesh and Myanmar has agreed upon. Uh, again, this is my something that by tomorrow is dead. But I find it interesting how um, there is apparently a degree of agreement or some kind of framework. A three stage basically means, it's nothing very original by the way, but basically means, okay, you stop violence first and you allowed a, a return. Then you have a second stage in which you work on the diplomatic solution between Bangladesh and Myanmar in the long term. And third, you have the international community basically putting money into development, poverty alleviation, and so on and so forth. It looks a way that everybody has a role, right? Based on their own strength. Um, and again, it's, it's so broad and general that might not mean much. But to me, it's interesting how the, the diplomatic way to do it is not to you know, raise your voice and, and push, because the reality is Myanmar is used to international pressure. Um, of course, face has a lot to do with it, but it's not just that. It's a country that's been used to decades of sanctions. And more, you, more pressure you put, the more they close. And so diplomatically, that's not the way to go. Um, this is not to say that the, the human side of this is absolutely appalling and something has to be done um, urgently. And that's where I see more a role of the international community, particularly the United Nations, where I don't see any role of the Security Council. As you know, the Security Council has been able to make a kind of presiden presidential statement is the slowest common denominator. Actually, press <coughs> statement is the very lowest um, uh, denominator. Uh, then there is a, pre state, uh, pre uh, uh, a presidential statement, which is the president of the Council of the Month that makes a statement, which still requires an agreement. Uh, and finally, obviously, there is a resolution. Uh, there was no way to do a resolution on, on Myanmar, so they came down with a presidential statement, which doesn't have any particular you know, uh, enforcement. But I don't think that is the right chamber to have a conversation on Myanmar. I see a role um, as a quieter diplomatic role for the UN. 
uh, because they can obviously bring uh, expertise uh, in uh, sort of post-crisis uh, alleviation uh, and, and then of course in, in the logistics, huh? the running the camps, because when you talk about who you can do this, obviously the UN can play a big role. But politically, I wouldn't be uh, surprised that you know, we're not going to see much, much action there, and I would even say that that's not necessarily the most helpful way to go. Both of you sort of alluded to the fact that the perception in the West and maybe internationally of her and her constraints is actually rather uh, at least inaccurate or sort of a partial picture. So could, I mean, both of you perhaps give us a sense of what does she want out of this? And, and as a kind of an, an actor, is it indeed the right thing to talk about sort of her as the, the kind of the, the potential person who can come up with a solution to this? Or what, what, what's the truth of her position? I don't think Dorsu wanted this problem to erupt in the first place. Um, if anything, you know, she's, she's got this, I think this horrible responsibility of righting all wrongs um, that have accumulated practically since, I guess, 1948, 1958, 1962, 1988, what have you. And, and so all these compounded legacies, and, and I think this is, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the problem or the issue here, um, there have been tremendously high expectations, both internationally and domestically, that once, uh, once the National League for Democracy was voted in and Dorsu um, would become the leader of the country, uh, somehow all the, the problems that uh, the country was facing, the people were suffering, would be alleviated somehow. And, and that was the, the, the faith that the people had in, in the power of change. So, um, you know, when you have that high an expectation of you uh, as, as a single person, um, there's bound to be disappointment. And I think that's the situation we're facing now. She alone, I don't think, can come up with a solution. Um, she, she's having to preside over a rather fragmented society where um, I, I think both Adam and I and, and also Francesco have also alluded to this point about the very um, unsettled peace process or, or uh, the, the nationwide ceasefire negotiations, as it were, um, which the previous administration started, uh, could not conclude, uh, left things somewhat hanging, and therefore now um, the, the current government is going about it in its own way. So um, Francesco mentioned something about trust building, and, and that's what's exactly what's happening, because trust has been broken over and over and over again among the ethnics um, in the country. Um, as well as, uh, I think, among the polity itself, uh, that's a tremendous challenge. So when, when you have that, and I think this, this, this erupts, of course, I, I don't think any, any leader of, of a country wants this kind of thing on their plate, but now, uh, you know, like it or not, you have to deal with it. And, and that's, uh, that's the problem now. But when you deal with it, I think also Francesco uh, and, and Adam highlighted the problem of Rakhine. I think Rakhine State is the, probably the only state where uh, the ruling party and the government do not have strong support. They have these uh, negative perceptions, again, of victimhood. The Rakhines uh, also have these uh, sense of victimhood uh, for historical, deep-rooted reasons that Francesco has highlighted since the past, up to now because of uh, the low socioeconomic development, mm. um, coupled with, I think, uh, what they now see in the international media as um, uh, having the blame put squarely on them, have, have evoked all these very, I think, strong reactions that uh, probably don't bode well for stability. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, so, I, I, mean I, I don't want to labor this, but I, 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 my sense is this is something that has confused me as a non-expert about this. So, I mean, Adam, uh, I think what people abroad expected was that, you know, she is a Nobel laureate, a kind of, you know, sort of emblem of a certain type of, of human rights activist, and that when this, these bad things started to happen, she'd sort of speak up against it, and then she didn't. And I guess at a basic level, the question is, is it that she didn't want to, or she can't, or some kind of complicated mix of the two? Yeah, I, I think it's complicated, and, and I think, above all, the priority is the democratic transition. And, and the, this issue is, is secondary to that. Historically, if you look back, you know, she hasn't said an awful lot about this subject, so it's not something which she's, she's kind of felt very strongly in the past. But she does feel that she knew on entering office that this would be so, something that needed to be done. 
And that prompted her to ask Kofi Annan to come up with a plan. And I think that showed that on some basic level, at least she, she knew that, that there's international tension on the topic, that we need to be seen to do something. So I think one can say that much. I think, as you say, the confusion comes when the, the, there's this enormous crisis strikes and, um, and she's perceived not to, to, to speak out enough. And I think you know, one of the, the sort of unhealthy dynamics that, that have emerged, which I think alludes to what Francesca was also saying about the international approach, is that the government feels highly defensive. And there's, there are things that happen in, in, in the sort of media which we don't really notice, but which locally get enormous traction. So when the Turkish Deputy Prime Minister tweets photos from Aceh and Somalia and says what's happening in Rakhine is horrific, social media in Myanmar goes crazy and says the international system, international politicians, international media is against us. It's fake news. And there's an inability then to pass out the fake news from the real news and people who are accurately documenting abuses of what happens. And that's something which has infected the sort of polity at large and senior political leadership now. So, so that means that, that that to me is one of the reasons why it's become hard to, to engage the government on this topic because we've entered into this dynamic where they, they're, they're almost discounting what you say from the off. So we're beginning to inhabit just very different worlds of conceptually what's actually happening. Emma, I mean, do, do you want to sort of, I mean, you, you've also been in Yangon. I don't know if you want to talk about what you observed about the politics, but I also, I mean, this is a sort of running theme in this discussion about the role of the international media and, and for the purposes of this panel, you're it. Um, so I don't know if you want to either kind of defend or, or, or sort of do a mea culpa in, on this, this issue that somehow the, the kind of the way this has been reported internationally has been problematic. I mean, I, I'm not quite sure whether we should agree with this or not or what you feel about it. So One of the problems has been that there's very little access to the Rakhine state for, for journalists. Uh, and when... When, when journalists are allowed in it, it's sort of a very, as I understand it, as I have not been there, it's very sort of heavily monitored and, and sort of you know, moved around and, and sort of you, you don't get access to, 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 to people there. So that would help if there was more access to the Rakhine state. That would help, um, you know, meaning that international journalism would, would, is not just based on people such as myself going to Bangladesh. Um, but so instead people have to resort to talking to people and, and trying to make sure that you talk to people as soon as they, they've come over uh, to Bangladesh to, um, to try and verify those, those statements and, and rely also on aerial, aerial pictures which do show villages that have been burnt uh, and do show you know, mass evacuations of people. I mean, obviously, the reasons that, that Rohingya refugees leave are, are, differ from person to person. I mean, there is obviously a, a, a systematic uh, you know, mass uh, sort of killings, and, and people, women have reported rape, but there might also be reasons of, of leaving for famine. Uh, you know, people have not necessarily had access to, to food. Um, there's been an amnesty report this week showing, you know, talking about a sort of apartheid in, in Rakhine State, of people unable to, to leave certain areas, of, of being sort of punished if they, if they do so. So, I mean, having better access in Myanmar would, would, would help, uh, I think, um, you know, if, if you know, balance, just by sheer, sheer balancing it out in terms of you know, having more people on the ground. I think there have been some problems. I mean, as, as Adam alluded to, uh, social media... Uh, is is a sort of a source of, of all sorts of, of news and intrigue and and so-called fake news. Um, there's also slip-ups. Um, there was a recent report uh, from the AP which misreported uh, something that Dor Dorsu had said. Uh, you know, she'd been talking about uh, the uh, you know threats to the, the world, uh, which included. Uh, you know, immigration and uh, terrorism, and as, as the AP originally reported it, uh, those two sort of seemed to be, you know, she was, they, they were suggesting that you know, illegal immigration was causing terrorism. That wasn't what, what she said. It was part of a list of, of threats to the world. Um, but to AP's credit, they put in a long, uh, long correction today, you know, saying what, what actually had been, you know, what actually had been the, the, you know, said. So I think journalism has has a difficult uh, role to, to, you know, in, in this in this sort of situation, and that, you know, you know journalism is, is facing uh, its its own its own pressures on it. You know, there's sort of the 
fewer, fewer places have foreign correspondents to go out. Um, there's, there's an advertising problem with, with journalism. But I think that the, you know, there's also a case in which Myanmar has not made it easy for foreign journalists. Um, and I think that that the, the reporting has generally been of very high quality. Francesca, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to comment on any of that in particular or whether we should sort of move on to the, the, the sort of vexed question about where we, where we go next. I, I think what we're trying to say is that we need, if we want to help, understand how these lines are read within Myanmar, right? So the, 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 just because the views are very different. So we're not oh, getting the, the economy is changing the editorial line. It's fine, but we have to understand how these things are perceived and what the impact they make on societies that see things in different ways. So that, that's that's all we say. Um, way forward, very hard. Um, in situation like this one, where I think it's it's what the, the, the literature of, of conflict resolution called um, a, a low trust. Uh, conference resolution situation, which basically the parties have no trust, right? You need to build trust. And how do you do that? Well, you need some kind of guarantor, right, for building this trust. Personally, I don't see anybody else or anything else than maybe ASEAN to play that kind of role, to kind of become a, a, a guarantor or a trust builder between parties. I don't think the UN can do that. I don't think that any European countries can really do that. I don't think China can really do that. Um, all these countries obviously have a role to play. And why, why don't you think China can do that? You just mentioned this, the, the plan, the three-part Chinese plan. Yeah, so, you know, first of all, this is all very new for China. So I am every day surprised to reading news of China getting more and more engaged in conference resolution and mediation around the world. I was very surprised six months ago when I read China getting engaged in South Sudan. Uh, I was surprised when they tried to do something in Afghanistan. I was, you know, so this is all very new. Every time I read the news, and I was like, wow, this, that's interesting. I mean, I think it is very interesting. Um, so I don't know where this is going, really. Um, but I, I, what I also don't know is how deep China wants to really get engaged. You know, one thing is to set up a framework, which we can agree upon, but then you have to make it happen. And to make it happen, it means to exercise political and maybe also economic influence, and I don't know where China really stand on that. ASEAN can play a role, again, as I said, more as a sort of a trust builder, in which you can have sort of periodical reporting, you can have check-in of things that are actually happening, um, you can have, you know, um, also at the lower level of bureaucracy, right? I don't think the problem is conversation between leaders, but it's more like as you move lower in the bureaucracy levels, that's where things uh, can be harder. So that's where I can see diplomatic potential role. Now, of course, the big question is, will actually ASEAN play that role? Uh, this ought to put a lot of pressure on Singapore, uh, which is going to chair ASEAN next year. Um, but, you know, there is a potential there. If I read you right in your introduction, you were sort of saying, unless something changes in the domestic setup, then, you know, you can do whatever you like internationally and nothing will work. Is it really that bleak, or if there was some kind of unusually sustained engagement from ASEAN and other actors? Is there, there sort of something that can be done here? I think it's really tough. And, and, and everyone who comes and, and you know, offer visit to the camps or visiting ministers, they want to know of the things in their policy toolkit, from sanctions to engagement, which bit of the toolkit to use to fix this problem. And they don't like it when people like me say it's not amenable to your toolkit, that the domestic political problems are not things that can be easily lobbied, right? How do you go to the commander in chief or the state councillor and say, you guys really need to have a conversation amongst yourselves, right? I mean, you just have to empathize, put yourself in, in their shoes. So what we're left with feels unsatisfying. And what happens is that we are reduced to initiatives rather than strategy. So, for example, yesterday there was the um, ASEM meeting taking place in Naypyidaw with all sorts of ASEAN and European leaders. It's at a foreign minister level with basically European and, uh, and uh, Asian um, foreign ministers, 40 or 50 of them. 
And one of the initiatives which came out of that was that there'll be a small group of kind of retired foreign minister, sort of eminent scholar types, who would help advise the government on, on how to deal with this problem and how to implement the recommendations that, that uh, Kofi Annan has made. And so that is what we're kind of left with, right? And it feels very modest because it is very modest. Um, but that's unfortunately some of what we can do as the international community uh, while encouraging those kind of people within the country who, who do have the power more at their fingertips for, for them to work out a solution between themselves. And just, again, before I go to Mo, was there anything that came out of, so Rex Tillerson, the US Secretary of State, was in the country this week. Did anything useful come out of that? I mean, his main focus was telling the military that the investigation that they did, which absolved themselves of all responsibility, was not credible. Um, and he said very frankly that you know, you may, you, your report sort of you know you, you may have, uh, have uh, you may believe it's credible, but but to the outside world you have to understand how how skeptical we all are. Um, now, what that will lead to? Um, will we see a sort of sudden realization that there should be an independent UN team allowed into the area to provide a, a, a different sort of investigation? I think is unlikely. But he wanted to to at a minimum very clearly send that message. Um, I think that, uh, and he also wanted to, I think, say to, to the Myanmar audience what they would and would not do in terms of sanctions. And this is an important debate going forward. And again, comes back to sort of the damage limitation argument, which is people feel very strongly that the military has done something wrong and there should be targeted sanctions against them. But sanctions have a complicated history in Myanmar. I think for, for, for many of us who sit in the country, we wouldn't want to see things that have unintended consequences that create collateral damage, by which I mean things that would um, profoundly hurt the civilian side of government or damage the economy. People are struggling already. Um, people have, have existing poverty, the economy slowing. The last thing the country as a whole needs is things that's going to, to hurt ordinary people who had nothing to do with this problem more. So um, I do think that when we think about um, the, the sorts of the measures going forward that we should avoid those that would um, have unintended consequences that hurt people who were not involved in this problem. So, so sort of sketch out what you think is the kind of rosy scenario in which ASEAN, uh, what, what could ASEAN reasonably do and, and is it likely to do so? Ten years ago when uh, Singapore was chairing ASEAN, 2007, um, ASEAN was trying to get um, at that time, the, the UN Special Envoy on Myanmar, Ibrahim Gambari, to come and talk about the situation in Myanmar after the Saffron Revolution. And at that time, Prime Minister was, was Uthain Sein, who later became president uh, with the 2010 elections, um, basically pulled the non-interference card and said, no, we'll go with the UN. Six months later, May 2008, Cyclone Nag has happened. And again, Singapore, as chair of ASEAN, convened a special meeting, point blank asked Myanmar, what, do you, what does ASEAN mean to you? And that's where uh, Myanmar said, OK, we'll go with ASEAN as long as uh, you coordinate the international humanitarian responses. And, uh, and so, yeah, you, you don't interfere openly, I guess, but there are a lot of, uh, I, I think, bending of that non-interference principle that happens behind closed doors that ASEAN, with its convening power, can leverage on. And uh, collectively assisting to coordinate something, I think, um, is, is, uh, it, it, it's something that people can, can justify to their domestic audiences. But then that's like um, 10 years ago. Um, the great thing about Nargis was that ASEAN's coordinating role came to the fore, and they managed to bring together different stakeholders that would probably not talk to each other. Um, and, and one of the issues, uh, which probably is not an issue today, simple enough as visa access, was actually brought up uh, to, to this policy coordination group called the Tripartite Core Group, which had the United Nations, ASEAN, and the government of Myanmar sitting together to sort out the issues. And the military personnel were involved in the uh, disaster relief uh, operations such that they got exposed to new ways of doing things. So I'm not saying replicate the Nargis response because Nargis is not 
uh, what we are seeing in Rakhine uh, today. ASEAN's uh, role comes in in that monitoring and coordination and, and kind of like keeping it on the agenda in a comfort zone where, say, the Myanmar leadership, the senior officials and the ministers can share what's going on, can share the constraints, and then uh, once you know the constraints, you can try to work out what can be done, not by 10 countries collectively, sometimes it can be by bilateral or minilateral initiatives, and this is what Indonesia's been doing. And um, ASEAN's not perfect, of course, but it has only been in the ASEAN framework or under the ASEAN uh, rubric that Myanmar, under the uh, National League for Democracy, has agreed to talk about this issue on Myanmar soil, which has never happened. Um, every time the Rohingya issue wanted to be brought up um, during the time of the military regime, it was always blocked and it was, it was never brought up. So um, the fact that I think uh, right now uh, discussions of this sort uh, have taken place in 2016 and are taking place uh, currently with Myanmar's full participation is something that I think uh, we have a pathway to work on. It's not perfect, it's not ideal, but um, next year Singapore is taking up the ASEAN chairmanship again and uh, of course uh, the, 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 the leadership here is also very much uh, alive to um, the implications of uh, uh, what's happening in Rakhine and the exodus has caused for regional security and so on. Uh, so, so we're looking at you know, possible new pathways of maybe a new approach that has ASEAN um, in another form of coordinating or monitoring role. But it needs sustained effort because ASEAN is not a funding agency, it doesn't have the dollars. Neither does it have the technical expertise, although uh, the ASEAN Coordinating Center on Humanitarian Assistance, I believe, is working with uh, some entities of the Myanmar government um, on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief coordination in the context, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, um, of, of the peace uh, negotiations, as well as possibly um, in any type of humanitarian response that the Myanmar government thinks it can it, it can mount in Rakhine. So, well, I see a hand going up at the on the. So, do, do we have microphones, or we just have to yell? Oh, we've got a microphone. Okay. So, we'll take questions in bunches of of two or three. Um, so, let's start here. I'd like to bring the Bangladesh perspective. I've just come back from uh, Dhaka six days ago, and I'm there every month working with Brack University. And there, uh, the sense is people are very on edge. Uh, the election is going to take place in a year plus, and so, of course, the Prime Minister wants this situation to be resolved very quickly. And that might be your ray of hope that you're looking for, James. <laughs> uh, the fact that there is pressure for uh, a peaceful resolution to this. However, at the same time, my colleague was abducted two weeks ago, a human rights uh, a researcher, Mubashar Hassan, and that has not made uh, international uh, news. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are fears because the Rohingya are actually located very close to these uh, Chittagong kill tracks who are not appearing in the public uh, statistics, official statistics of Bangladesh because they are considered as hill people. So that's another uh, uh, fear. And the, finally, the, the, the other fear that there is and that puts, puts pressure for uh, more uh, speedy uh, uh, resolution is the fear of extremism. It's only one year ago that Dhaka was attacked by extremists and that if they infiltrate this million uh, people uh, that might be actually uh, another bomb uh, taking off. So I'd like to know whether you think this... Uh I have a question about what is uh, happening right now. I mean yesterday also in the sidelines of the ASM conference I think uh, San Suu Kyi said that there was going to be talks with Bangladesh starting today, probably today, tomorrow um, in the framework of an agreement that they had from the 90s to start working about the, on the repatriation. Um, I want to ask you, I mean, what do you think about this? And I want to ask you, Francisco, maybe about what you were saying about China. Um, again, Chinese role in this, because um, I couldn't avoid by thinking yesterday when, when An San Suu Kyi made these comments that they go much in line with what China, the Chinese Foreign Affairs Minister, Wang Ji, recommended in these past two days, which was first bilateral talks. It seems pretty much that they are following China's advice on this. China is fully involved in Rakhine. So I just want to go back to China's role in all this and, and because perhaps it's more realistic than ASEAN as China perhaps has 
not much experience in mediating, but definitely interest. And ASEAN has the non-interference policy. So if we could please go back on China's role okay. in mediating the crisis. Super. Thank you. No, I, I, I agree that you know, China, China can play an important role. And, but I think here the big question again is how much political capital Beijing want to spend right, into becoming an active mediator, even if it's under the rubber screen. Right? You still need to spend capital. Right? And, and it's human resources, financial, it's political. This is something that has to be sustained in the long term. It's not just about, you know, okay, we have a framework, now we talk. You know, that, that's, not, that's not, not how it is. Um, we know, you know, regional negotiators or international negotiators getting wrapped up into a conflict for decades. And so I think China is actually very wary of not going down the path of, you know, becoming an international policeman. I actually see every day a little step to that direction, um, but I, I can't really comment on, on you know, the, the, the thinking of Beijing is, is going down that road. With that said, I absolutely agree that I think that they, they can play a, a, a positive and important role. Um, they are obviously playing some kind of role, but it's, 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 to me it's more setting up a framework in which they can find useful roles of other players and everybody, everybody can pitch in, right, in, in supporting the, the, the steps. Okay, so you end up something, and the Americans with the money, and so on and so forth, right? So you, 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 you compose the way, the, 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 the framework in a way that everybody can have some kind of role. And of course, it doesn't surprise me that they're pushing on the bilateral angle because that's very much their angle. Yes, I mean, I don't want to be incredibly uh, pessimistic, but I'm not sure that the fact that Bangladesh wants to move quickly is a ray of hope. I mean, you don't just need speed, you need a proper plan in place. And if you look at previous, uh, you know, the previous 1978, the 1990s, uh, you know, you know, when Rohingya went over to Bangladesh, uh, again, in those situations, the government also wanted them to go back <coughs> quickly. Um, and there were reports from NGOs at the time questioning about forced repatriation or the camps that didn't have their food uh, you know, r related to them. Um, so sort of this idea of you know, not wanting to make camps a pull factor uh, potentially coming into play. So I think that, yes, you can have Bangladesh wanting to be able to go quickly, but if they're going to go back to really quite squalid conditions in Myanmar, then that's still not a solution, because uh, if they're trapped in those squalid conditions, then you will have a humanitarian situation in Myanmar, and if they are free to you know, roam, which is unlikely, free to, to go around in Myanmar, they will probably come back to Bangladesh. So I think there's more likely something along the lines that Adam sketched out of, of a potential boat crisis coming into play. I think it's obvious that in Bangladesh this is seen as a huge political problem. Um, you, know, you see in Cox's Bazaar uh, posters uh, you know, talking about Sheikh Hasina as the mother of humanity uh, and the hope of the Rohingya. I wonder how long that will last. I mean, we're seeing now in Europe that Angela Merkel is, is being damaged for her, her generosity to Syrian refugees. Um, so I think that it is a huge political problem, but I don't think that it will just be solved by them wanting you know, Rohingya to, to leave. Uh, and indeed, I think that you have people there who have been there since the 1990s who are, you know, haven't been able to you know, have access to education, haven't been able to have access to work. Uh, so in a similar parallel to the European refugee crisis, uh, there's sort of been a sort of a stateless underclass created, I think. Uh, you can see it in the way that people refer to Rohingya. Not only are they called Bengali in, in Myanmar, but in Bangladesh, they're, they're, as I understand it, forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals, so they're not refugees. Mm. Um, so I think that these people are stateless, not in just in terms of the way where they're living, but in the way that they're described. I think repatriation is only the first step. Because uh, after repatriation, like what Emma pointed out, there needs to be some kind of reintegration. The, the, the tensions and all these horrible things that we've seen, uh, that we've uh, heard of and seen and you know, read reports of, have happened because after, 1970, after the 1970 exodus, after the 1991-92 exodus, when there was repatriation, there was no proper reintegration programs, as it were, uh, for the communities. Rather, there was even more purposeful entrenching of uh, polarization and segregation. And uh, the lesson that the military learned from these exoduses in the past was, we need to do more to control. And, and so that's how they, they formed this, this kind of like, I, I guess, a control. Uh, uh, the, there's a term. Uh, the, the acronym in, in Burmese is NASAKA.
and it's basically to monitor the immigration and other social status of the Rohingya communities. Now, international pressure in 2014 led to the USDP government dismantling that. But um, the, uh, the, the security and the military perspective uh, uh, in Myanmar uh, from, from uh, I guess, the, the, the military uh, community, so to speak, hold that because that was dismantled, there was no way to monitor uh, the movements and therefore now we have uh, the situation that you saw with the, uh, the reported insurgency and so on, uh, which is quite a binary view to take because uh, I would look at more of uh, the broader thing. Now, the other thing about negotiating repatriation, uh, who negotiates repatriation is the Ministries of Foreign Affairs. And uh, both in the 1978 and the 1992 exoduses, it was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the day that had to go and meet his counterpart in Dhaka and sort out the agreement. At both instances, uh, the agreement was premised on the fact that Burma, Myanmar would accept back uh, anybody who could prove that they are a resident. And of course, the inevitable question is, yes, when people flee across the border, what kind of documentation do they have to show that they are a resident? And the comeback is, if they can say which village they come from, who is their headman, and who are their neighbors, then we will stop that as the first step of verification. And I can say this with a level of confidence because I was one of the scribes taking notes in 1992 for the joint agreement. But foreign ministers go and negotiate. Who implements? And that's the rub of the issue. As long as the implementation is by another uh, entity, another uh, government ministry or by the military itself and uh, there is no kind of coordinated uh, monitoring or, 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 or reporting going on, then you're going to have the same kind of situation recurring over and over again. And this is, okay, we're talking about the Rohingyas and the Rakhine. There are still unrepatriated refugees in Thailand. There are still refugee communities along the thai Burma border. And some of uh, the uh, uh, regularization and repatriation of these refugees from the east has started. But again, uh, there are no reintegration programs once the refugees, the former refugees or the former undocumented migrants have returned. So I think if we're looking at programs of assistance and so on, we'll also need to look at what happens after repatriation. And uh, I completely concur with Emma about the dangers of, yes, uh, of course there is a pressure of uh, uh, pushing back people over the border, but it can result in forced repatriation, and, and that's one of the basic principles of international humanitarian law, where you don't force people to go back to situations where they still feel uh, unsafe or where uh, things are just not there. Adam, so uh, whether on Bangladesh or a magisterial summation of, uh, given you're going back to Myanmar this evening, yeah. um, uh, give us a few sort of last thoughts of, uh, of where we're going before we let, let the audience go about their business. Yeah, I mean, I, I said that I wasn't here to, to provide a sort of a blueprint solution, um, and I won't try to do that in closing, but I do think that some of, of what we've talked about that has come up um, if not uh, sort of rays of hope that are things that we can cling to to at least move the conversation forward a little bit. And I would like to give a, a sort of strong endorsement for this idea that, that ASEAN can play uh, a bit more of a role than they have already. And um, they are there, they are present in Rakhine State, they have a humanitarian presence there. There is a scenario where if ASEAN leaders decide to make that a priority, um, and the right sort of political discussions happen with Myanmar, that they become the sort of um, most acceptable international presence that the Myanmar side can, can deal with, given their antipathy towards the UN. And I would put more faith in that happening than, a, than in a Chinese-led plan. Um, so just to, to say that not all hope is lost, it is contingent upon so many people in the international system um, doing the right thing and to to try to move things forward at a time when people are pushing for a grand solution which I don't think exists. So um, in short, don't give up uh, hope completely. Uh, we can prevent the very worst from happening and uh, even if the conflict can't be resolved, it can be better managed. Very good. Well, over to you, Singapore, as ASEAN Chair. Um, thank you very much for coming. I'm sorry we didn't have time for more questions. Please give a round of applause to all four of my panelists for a excellent discussion.